Chapter 49, Part 6 of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dick Durrett. Conquest of Italy by the Franks, Part 6 There is nothing perhaps more adverse to nature and reason than to hold in obedience remote countries and foreign nations in opposition to their inclination and interest. A torrent of barbarians may pass over the earth, but an extensive empire must be supported by a refined system of policy and oppression. In the center, an absolute power, prompt in action and rich in resources, a swift and easy communication with the extreme parts, a fortifications to check the first effort of rebellion, a regular administration to protect and punish, and a well-disciplined army to instate fear without provoking discontent and despair. Far different was the situation of the German Caesars, who were ambitious to enslave the kingdom of Italy. Their patrimonial estates were stretched along the Rhine or scattered in the provinces, but this ample domain was alienated by the imprudence of distress of successive princes and their revenue from minute and vexatious prerogative was scarcely sufficient for the maintenance of their household. Their troops were formed by the legal or voluntary service of their feudal vassals who passed the Alps with reluctance, assumed the license of rapine and disorder, and capriciously deserted before the end of the campaign. Whole armies were swept away by the pestilential influence of the climate. The survivors brought back the bones of their princes and nobles, and the effects of their intemperance were often imputed to the treachery and malice of the Italians, who rejoiced at least in the calamities of the barbarians. This irregular tyranny might contend on equal terms with the petty tyrants of Italy, nor can the people or the reader be much interested in the event of the quarrel. But in the 11th and 12th centuries, The Lombards rekindled the flame of industry and freedom, and the generous example was at length imitated by the republics of Tuscany. In the Italian cities, a municipal government had never been totally abolished, and their first privileges were granted by the favor and policy of the emperors, who were desirous of erecting a plebeian barrier against the independence of the nobles. But their progress was rapid, the daily extension of their power and pretensions were founded on the numbers and spirit of these rising communities. Each city filled the measure of her diocese or district, the jurisdiction of the counts and bishops, of the marquises and counts, was banished from the land and the proudest nobles were persuaded or compelled to desert their solitary castles and to embrace the more honorable character of freemen and magistrates. The legislative authority was inherent in the General Assembly, but the executive powers were entrusted to three councils annually chosen from the three orders of captains valvassors and commons into which the republic was divided. Under the protection of equal law, the labors of agriculture and commerce were gradually revived, 
but the martial spirit of the Lombards was nourished by the presence of danger, and as often as the bell was rung or the standard erected, the gates of the city poured forth a numerous and intemperate intep- band whose re- zeal in their own cause was soon guided by the use and discipline of arms. At the foot of these popular ramparts, the pride of the Caesars was overthrown, and the invincible genius of liberty prevailed over the two Fredericks, the greatest princes of the Middle Age, the first superior, perhaps in military prowess, the second, who undoubtedly excelled in the softer accomplishments of peace and learning. Ambitious of restoring the splendor of the purple, Frederick I invaded the republics of Lombardy with the arts of a statesman, the valor of a soldier, and the cruelty of a tyrant. The recent discovery of the Pandex had renewed a science most favorable to despotism, and his venal advocates proclaimed the emperor the absolute master of the lives and properties of his subjects. His royal prerogatives, in a less odious sense, were acknowledged in the Diet of Roncaglia, and the revenue of Italy was fixed at 30,000 pounds of silver, which were multiplied to an indefinite demand by the rapine of the fiscal offices. The obstinate cities were reduced by the terror or the force of his arms, his captives were delivered to the executioner or shot from his military engines, and, after the siege and surrender of Milan, the buildings of that stately capital were razed to the ground, 300 hostages were sent into Germany, and the inhabitants were dispersed in four villages under the yoke of the inflexible emperor. But Milan soon rose from her ashes, and the League of Lombardy was cemented by distress. The cause was espoused by Venice, Pope Alexander III, and the Greek Emperor. The fabric of oppression was overturned in a day, and in the Treaty of Constance, Frederick subscribed, with some reservations, the freedom of four and twenty cities. His grandson contended with their vigor and maturity, but Frederick II was endowed with some personal and peculiar advantages. His birth and education recommended him to the Italians, and in the implacable discord of the two factions, the Ghibellins were attached to the emperor while the Goeths displayed the banner of liberty and the church. The court of Rome had slumbered when his father Henry VI was permitted to unite with the empire the kingdoms of Naples and Sicily, and from these hereditary realms the son derived an ample and ready supply of troops and treasure. Yet Frederick II was finally oppressed by the arms of the Lombards and the thunders of the Vatican, his kingdom was given to a stranger, and the last of his family was beheaded at Naples on a public scaffold. During sixty years no emperor appeared in Italy, and the name was remembered only by the ignominious sale of the last relics of sovereignty. The barbarian conquerors of the West were pleased to decorate their chief with a title of emperor, but it was not their design to invest him with the despotism of Constantine and Justinian. The persons of the Germans were free, their conquests were their own, and their national character was animated by a spirit which scorned the servile jurisprudence of the new or the ancient Rome. It would have been a vain and dangerous attempt to impose a monarch 
on the armed freemen who were impatient of a magistrate, on the bold who refused to obey, on the powerful who aspired to command. The empire of Charlemagne and Otto was distributed among the dukes of the nations or provinces, the counts of the smaller districts, and the margraves of the marshes or frontiers, who all united the civil and military authority as it had been delegated to the lieutenants of the first Caesars. The Roman governors, who for the most part were soldiers of fortune, reduced their mercenary legions, assumed the imperial purple, and either failed or succeeded in their revolt without wounding the power and unity of the government. If the dukes and margraves and counts of Germany were less audacious in their claims, the consequences of their success were more lasting and pernicious to the state. Instead of aiming at the supreme rank, they silently labored to establish and appropriate their provincial independence. Their ambition was seconded by the weight of their estates and vassals, their mutual example and support, the common interest of the subordinate nobility, the change of princes and families, the minorities of Otho III and Henry IV, the ambition of the popes, and the vain pursuit of the fugitive crowns of Italy and Rome. All the attributes of regal and territorial jurisdiction were gradually usurped by the commanders of the provinces, the right of peace and war, of life and death, of coinage and taxation, of foreign alliance and domestic economy. Whatever had been seized by violence was ratified by favor or distress, was granted as the price of a doubtful vote or a voluntary service, Whatever had been granted to one could not, without injury, be denied to a successor or equal, and every act of local or temporary possession was insensibly molded into the constitution of the Germanic kingdom. In every province, the visible presence of the duke or count was interposed between the throne and the nobles. The subjects of the law became the vassals of a private chief, and the standard which he received from his sovereign was often raised against him in the field. The temporal power of the clergy was cherished and exalted by the superstition or policy of the Carlovingian and Saxon dynasties, who blindly depended on their moderation and fidelity, and the bishoprics of Germany were made equal in extent and privilege superior in wealth and population to the most ample states of the military order. As long as the emperors retained the prerogative of bestowing on every vacancy these ecclesiastic and secular benefices, their cause was maintained by the gratitude or ambition of their friends and favorites. But in the quarrel of the investitures, they were deprived of their influence over the Episcopal chapters, the freedom of election was restored, and the sovereign was reduced by a solemn mockery to his first prayers, the recommendation, once in his reign, to a single prebend in each church. The secular governors, instead of being recalled at the will of a superior, could be degraded only by the sentence of their peers. In the first age of the monarchy, the appointment of the son to the duchy or county of his father was solicited as a favor, it was gradually obtained as a custom, and extorted as a right. The lineal succession was often extended to the collateral or female branches, the states of the empire, their popular and at length their legal appellation, were divided and alienated by testament and sale, and all idea of a public trust was lost in that of a private and perpetual inheritance. The emperor could not even be enriched by the casualties of forfeiture and extinction, 
within the term of a year he was obliged to dispose of the vacant fief, and in the choice of the candidate it was his duty to consult either the general or the provincial diet. After the death of Frederick II, Germany was left a monster with a, with a hundred heads. A crowd of princes and prelates disputed the ruins of the empire. The lords of innumerable castles were less prone to obey than to imitate their superiors, and according to the measure of their strength, their incessant hostilities received the names of conquest or robbery. Such anarchy was the inevitable consequence of the laws and manners of Europe, and the kingdoms of France and Italy were shivered into fragments by the violence of the same tempest. But the Italian cities and the French vassals were divided and destroyed, while the union of the Germans had produced, under the name of an empire, a great system of a federative republic. In the frequent and last, the perpetual institution of diets, a national spirit was kept alive, and the powers of a common legislature are still exercised by the three branches or colleges of the electors, the princes, and the free and imperial cities of Germany. Seven of the most powerful feudatories were permitted to assume, with a distinguished name and rank, the exclusive privilege of choosing the Roman emperor, and these electors were the king of Bohemia, the duke of Saxony, and the margrave of Brandenburg, the count Palatine of the Rhine, and the three archbishops of Mentz, of Trevis, and of Cologne. The College of Princes and Prelates purged themselves of a promiscuous multitude. They reduced to four representative votes the long series of independent counts and excluded the nobles or equestrian order, 60,000 of whom, as in the Polish diets, had appeared on horseback in the field of election. The pride of birth and dominion of the sword and the mitre wisely adopted the commons as the third branch of the legislature, and in the progress of society they were introduced about the same era into the national assemblies of France, England, and Germany. The Hanseatic League commanded the trade and navigation of the North, the Confederates of the Rhine secured the peace and intercourse of the inland country. The influence of the cities had been adequate to their wealth and policy, and their negative still invalidates the acts of the two superior colleges of electors and princes. It is in the 14th century that we may view in the strongest light the state and contrast of the Roman Empire of Germany, which no longer held, except on the borders of the Rhine and Danube, a single province of Trajan or Constantine. Their unworthy successors were the counts of Habsburg, of Nassau, of Luxembourg, and Schwarzenberg. The Emperor Henry the Seventh procured for his son the crown of Bohemia, and his grandson Charles the Fourth was born among a people strange and barbarous in the estimation of the Germans themselves. After the excommunication of Louis of Bavaria, he received the gift or promise of the vacant empire from the Roman pontiffs, who, in the exile and captivity of Avignon, affected the dominion of the earth. The death of his competitors united the Electoral College, and Charles was unanimously saluted King of the Romans and future Emperor, a title which, in the same age, was prostituted to the Caesars of Germany and Greece. The German Emperor was no more than the elective and impotent magistrate of an aristocracy of princes who had not left him a village that he might call his own. 
His best prerogative was the right of presiding and proposing in the National Senate, which was convened at his summons, and his native kingdom of Bohemia, less opulent than the adjacent city of Nuremberg, was the firmest seat of his power and the richest source of his revenue. The army with which he passed the Alps consisted of 300 horses. In the cathedral of St. Ambrose, Charles was crowned with the iron crown which tradition ascribed to the Lombard monarchy, but he was admitted only with a peaceful train. The gates of the city were shut upon him, and the king of Italy was held a captive by the arms of the Visconti, whom he confirmed in the sovereignty of Milan. In the Vatican he was again crowned with the golden crown of the empire, but in obedience to a secret treaty, the Roman emperor immediately withdrew without reposing a single night within the walls of Rome. The eloquent Petrarch, whose fancy revived the visionary glories of the capital, deplores and upbraids the ignominious flight of the Bohemian, and even his contemporaries could observe that the sole exercise of his authority was in the lucrative sale of privileges and titles. The gold of Italy secured the election of his son, but such was the shameful poverty of the Roman Empire that his person was arrested by a butcher in the streets of Worms and was detained in the public inn as a pledge or hostage for the payment of his expenses. From this humiliating scene, let us turn to the apparent majesty of the same Charles in the diets of the empire. The golden bull, which, af- which fixes the Germanic constitution, is promulgated in the style of a sovereign and legislator. A hundred princes bowed before his throne and exalted their own dignity by the voluntary honors which they yielded to their chief or minister. At the royal banquet, the hereditary great officers, the seven electors who in rank and title were equal to the kings, performed their solemn and domestic service of the palace. The seals of the triple kingdom were borne in state by the archbishops of Mentz, Cologne, and Treves, the perpetual arch-chancellors of Germany, Italy, and Arles, The great marshal, on horseback, exercised his function with a silver measure of oats, which he emptied on the ground, and immediately dismounted to regulate the order of the guests. The the great steward, the Count Palatine of the Rhine, placed the dishes on the table. The great chamberlain, the Margrave of Brandenburg, presented after the repast the golden ewer and basin to wash. The king of Bohemia, as great cupbearer, was represented by the emperor's brother, the Duke of Luxembourg and Brabant, and the procession was closed by the great huntsman, who introduced a boar and a stag with a loud chorus of horns and hounds. Nor was the supremacy of the emperor confined to Germany alone. The hereditary monarchs of Europe confessed the preeminence of his rank and dignity. He was the first of the Christian princes, the temporal head of the great republic of the West. To his person the title of majesty was long appropriated, and he disputed with the Pope the sublime prerogative of creating kings and assembling councils. The oracle of the civil law, the learned Bartolus, was a pensioner of Charles IV, and his school resounded with the doctrine that the Roman emperor was the rightful sovereign of the earth from the rising to the setting sun. The contrary opinion was condemned not as an error, but as a heresy, since even the gospel had pronounced, and there went forth a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. 
If we annihilate the interval of time and space between Augustus and Charles, strong and striking will be the contrast between the two Caesars. The Bohemian who concealed his weakness under the mask of ostentatious and the Roman who disguised his strength under the semblance of modesty. At the head of his victorious legions, in his reign over the sea and land, from the Nile and the Euphrates to the Atlantic Ocean, Augustus professed himself the servant of the state and the equal of his fellow citizens. The conqueror of Rome and her provinces assumed a popular and legal form of a censor, a council, and a tribune. His will was the law of mankind, but in the declaration of his laws he borrowed the voice of the senate and people, and from their decrees their master accepted and renewed his temporary commission to administer the republic. In his dress, his domestics, his titles, in all the offices of social life, Augustus maintained the character of a private Roman, and his most artful flatterers respected the secret of his absolute and perpetual monarchy. End of chapter 49, part 6。Chapter 50, part 1 of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5, Chapter 50, Part 1. Description of Arabia and its Inhabitants. Birth, Character, and Doctrine of Muhammad. He preaches at Mecca, flies to Medina, propagates his religion by the sword, voluntary or reluctant submission of the Arabs, his death and successors, the claims and fortunes of Ali and his descendants. After pursuing above 600 years the fleeting Caesars of Constantinople and Germany, I descend, in the reign of Heraclius, on the eastern borders of the Greek monarchy. While the state was exhausted by the Persian War, and the church was distracted by the Nestorian and Monophysite sects, Muhammad, with the sword in one hand and the Koran in the other, erected his throne on the ruins of Christianity and of Rome. The genius of the Arabian prophet, the manners of his nation, the spirit of his religion, involve the causes of the decline and fall of the Eastern Empire, and our eyes are currently intent on one of the most memorable revolutions, which have impressed a new and lasting character on the nations of the globe. In the vacant space between Persia, Syria, Egypt, and Ethiopia, the Arabian Peninsula may be conceived as a triangle of spacious but irregular dimensions. From the northern point of Beles on the Euphrates, a line of 1,500 miles is terminated by the Straits of Babel Mandeb in the land of frankincense, About half this length may be allowed for the middle breadth, from east to west, from Basra to Suez, from the Persian Gulf to the Red Sea. The sides of the triangle are gradually enlarged, and the southern basis presents a front of a thousand miles to the Indian Ocean. The entire surface of the peninsula exceeds in fourfold proportion that of Germany or France, but the far greater part has been justly stigmatized with the epithets of the stony, and of the sandy. Even the wilds of Tartary are decked, by the hand of nature, with lofty trees and luxuriant herbage, and the lonesome traveler derives a sort of comfort and society from the presence of vegetable life. But in the dreary waste of Arabia, a boundless level of sand is intersected by sharp and naked mountains, and the face of the desert, without shade or shelter, is scorched by the direct and intense rays of a tropical sun. Instead of refreshing breezes, the winds, particularly from the southwest, diffuse a noxious and even deadly vapor. The hillocks of sand, which they alternately raise or scatter, are compared to the billows of the ocean, and the whole caravans, whole armies, have been lost and buried in the whirlwind. 
The common benefits of water are an object of desire and contest, and such is the scarcity of wood that some art is requisite to preserve and propagate the element of fire. Arabia is destitute of navigable rivers, which fertilize the soil and convey its produce to the adjacent regions. The torrents that fall from the hills are imbibed by the thirsty earth. The rare and hardy plants, the tamarind or the acacia, that strike their roots into the clefts of the rocks, are nourished by the dews of the night. A scanty supply of rain is collected in cisterns and aqueducts. The wells and springs are the secret treasure of the desert. And the pilgrim of Mecca, after many a dry and sultry march, is disgusted by the taste of the waters which have rolled over a bed of sulphur or salt. Such is the general and genuine picture of the climate of Arabia. The experience of evil enhances the value of any local or partial enjoyments. A shady grove, a green pasture, a stream of fresh water, are sufficient to attract a colony of sedentary Arabs to the fortunate spots, which can afford food and refreshment to themselves and their cattle, and which encourage their industry in the cultivation of the palm tree and the vine. The high lands that border on the Indian Ocean are distinguished by their superior plenty of wood and water. The air is more temperate, the fruits are more delicious, the animals and the human race are more numerous. The fertility of the soil invites and rewards the toil of the husbandman, and the peculiar gifts of frankincense and coffee have attracted in different ages the merchants of the world. If it be compared with the rest of the peninsula, this sequestered region may truly deserve the appellation of the happy, and the splendid coloring of fancy and fiction has been suggested by contrast and countenanced by distance. It was for this earthly paradise that nature had reserved her choicest favors and her most curious workmanship. The incompatible blessings of luxury and innocence were ascribed to the natives. The soil was impregnated with gold and gems, and both the land and sea were taught to exhale the odors of aromatic sweets. This division of the sandy, the stony, and the happy, so familiar to the Greeks and Latins, is unknown to the Arabians themselves, and it is of singular enough that a country whose language and inhabitants have ever been the same should scarcely retain a vestige of its ancient geography. The maritime districts of Bahrain and Oman are opposite to the realm of Persia, the kingdom of Yemen displays the limits, or at least the situation, of Arabia Felix. The name of Neged is extended over the inland space, and the birth of Mohammed has illustrated the province of Hejaz along the coast of the Red Sea. The measure of population is regulated by the means of subsistence, and the inhabitants of this vast peninsula might be outnumbered by the subjects of a fertile and industrious province. Along the shores of the Persian Gulf, of the ocean, and even of the Red Sea, the ichthyophagi, or fish-eaters, continue to wander in quest of their precarious food. In this primitive and abject state, which ill deserves the name of society, the human brute, without arts or laws, and almost without sense or language, is poorly distinguished from the rest of the animal creation. Generations and ages might roll away in silent oblivion, and the helpless savage was restrained from multiplying his race by the wants and pursuits which confined his existence to the narrow margin of the sea-coast. But in an early period of antiquity, the great body of the Arabs had emerged from this scene of misery, and, as the naked wilderness could not maintain a people of hunters, they rose at once to the more secure and plentiful condition of the pastoral life. The same life is uniformly pursued by the roving tribes of the desert, and in the portrait of the modern Bedouins, we may trace the features of their ancestors, who, in the age of Moses or Mohammed, dwelt under similar tents, and conducted their horses and camels and sheep to the same springs and the same pastures. Our toil is lessened, and our wealth is increased, by our dominion over the useful animals, and the Arabian shepherd had acquired the absolute possession of a faithful friend and a laborious slave. Arabia, in the opinion of the naturalist, is the genuine and original country of the horse, the climate most propitious not indeed to the size, but to the spirit and swiftness of that generous animal. The merit of the barb, 
the Spanish and the English breed is derived from a mixture of Arabian blood, and the Bedouins preserve, with superstitious care, the honors and memory of the purest race. The males are sold at a high price, but the females are seldom alienated, and the birth of a noble foal was estimated among the tribes as a subject of joy and mutual congratulation. These horses are educated in the tents, among the children of the Arabs, with a tender familiarity which trains them in the habits of gentleness and attachment. They are accustomed only to walk and to gallop. Their sensations are not blunted by the incessant abuse of the spur and the whip. Their powers are reserved for the moments of flight and pursuit. But no sooner do they feel the touch of the hand or the stirrup than they dart away with the swiftness of the wind. And if their friend be dismounted in the rapid career, they instantly stop till he has recovered his seat. In the sands of Africa and Arabia, the camel is a sacred and precious gift. That strong and patient beast of burden can perform, without eating or drinking, a journey of several days. And a reservoir of fresh water is preserved in a large bag, a fifth stomach of the animal, whose body is imprinted with the marks of servitude. The larger breed is capable of transporting a weight of a thousand pounds, and the dromedary, of a lighter and more active frame, outstrips the fleetest courser in the race. Alive or dead, almost every part of the camel is serviceable to man. Her milk is plentiful and nutritious. The young and tender flesh has the taste of veal. A valuable salt is extracted from the urine. The dung supplies the deficiency of fuel. And the long hair, which falls every year and is renewed, is coarsely manufactured into the garments, the furniture, and the tents of the Bedouins. In the rainy season they consume the rare and insufficient herbage of the desert. During the heats of summer and the scarcity of winter they remove their encampments to the sea coast, the hills of Yemen, or the neighborhood of the Euphrates, and have often extorted the dangerous license of visiting the banks of the Nile and the villages of Syria and Palestine. The life of a wandering Arab is a life of danger and distress, and though sometimes, by rapine or exchange, he may appropriate the fruits of industry, a private citizen in Europe is in the possession of more solid and pleasing luxury than the proudest emir who marches in the field at the head of ten thousand horse. Yet an essential difference may be found between the hordes of Scythia and the Arabian tribes, since many of the latter were collected into towns and employed in the labors of trade and agriculture. A part of their time and industry was still devoted to the management of their cattle. They mingled in peace and war with their brethren of the desert, and the Bedouins derived from their useful intercourse some supply of their wants and some rudiments of art and knowledge. Among the forty-two cities of Arabia, enumerated by Abu Feda, the most ancient and populous were situate in the happy Yemen. The towers of Sana and the marvelous reservoir of Mareb were constructed by the kings of the Homerites, but their profound luster was eclipsed by the prophetic glories of Medina and Mecca, near the Red Sea, and at a distance from each other of two hundred and seventy miles. The last of these holy places was known to the Greeks under the name of Makaraba, and the termination of the word is expressive of its greatness, which has not indeed, in the most flourishing period, exceeded the size and populousness of Marseilles. Some latent motive, perhaps of superstition, must have impelled the founders in the choice of a most unpromising situation. They erected their habitations of mud or stone in a plain about two miles long and one mile broad, at the foot of three barren mountains. The soil is a rock. The water, even of the holy well of Zemzem, is bitter or brackish. The pastures are remote from the city, and grapes are transported above seventy miles from the gardens of Taif. The fame and spirit of the Koreishites, who reigned in Mecca, were conspicuous among the Arabian tribes, but their ungrateful soil refused the labors of agriculture, and their position was favorable to the enterprises of trade. By the seaport of Geta, at a distance of only forty miles, they maintained an easy correspondence with Abyssinia, and that Christian kingdom afforded the first refuge of the disciples of Muhammad. The treasures of Africa were conveyed over the peninsula to Gera, or Katif, in the province of Bahrain, a city built, as it is said, of rock salt by the Chaldean exiles, 
and from thence, with the native pearls of the Persian Gulf, they were floated on rafts to the mouth of the Euphrates. Mecca is placed almost at an equal distance, a month's journey, between Yemen on the right and Syria on the left hand. The former was the winter, the latter the summer of the station of her caravans, and their seasonable arrival relieved the ships of India from the tedious and troublesome navigation of the Red Sea. In the markets of Sana and Merab, in the harbors of Oman and Aden, the camels of the Koreshites were laden with a precious cargo of aromatics, and a supply of corn and manufactures were purchased in the fairs of Basra and Damascus. The lucrative exchange diffused plenty and riches in the streets of Mecca, and the noblest of her sons united the love of arms with the profession of merchandise. The perpetual independence of the Arabs has been the theme of praise among the strangers and natives, and the arts of controversy transform this singular event into a prophecy and a miracle in favor of the posterity of Ismael. Some exceptions that can neither be dissembled nor eluded render this mode of reasoning as indiscreet as it is superfluous. The kingdom of Yemen has been successively subdued by the Abyssinians, the Persians, the sultans of Egypt, and the Turks. The holy cities of Mecca and Medina have repeatedly bowed under a Scythian tyrant, and the Roman province of Arabia embraced the peculiar wilderness in which Ismael and his sons must have pitched their tents in the face of their brethren. Yet these exceptions are temporary or local. The body of the nation has escaped the yoke of the most powerful monarchies, the arms of Sesostris and Cyrus, of Pompey and Trajan, could never achieve the conquest of Arabia. The present sovereign of the Turks may exercise a shadow of jurisdiction, but his pride is reduced to solicit the friendship of a people whom it is dangerous to provoke and fruitless to attack. The obvious causes of their freedom are inscribed on the character and country of the Arabs. Many ages before Muhammad, their intrepid valor had been severely felt by their natives in offensive and defensive war. The patient and active virtues of a soldier are insensibly nursed in the habits and discipline of a pastoral life. The care of the sheep and camels is abandoned to the women of the tribe, but the martial youth under the banner of the emir is ever on horseback and in the field to practice the exercise of the bow, the javelin, and the scimitar. The long memory of their independence is the firmest pledge of its perpetuity, and succeeding generations are animated to prove their descent and to maintain their inheritance. Their domestic feuds are suspended on the approach of a common enemy, and, in their last hostility against the Turks, the caravan of Mecca was attacked and pillaged by fourscore thousands of the Confederates. When they advance to battle, the hope of victory is in the front, in the rear, the assurance of a retreat. Their horses and camels, who in eight or ten days can perform a march of four or five hundred miles, disappear before the conqueror. The secret waters of the desert elude his search, and his victorious troops are consumed with thirst, and hunger, and fatigue, in the pursuit of an invisible foe, who scorns his efforts, and safely reposes in the heart of the burning solitude. The arms and deserts of the Bedouins are not only the safeguards of their own freedom, but the barriers also of the happy Arabia, whose inhabitants, remote from war, are enervated by the luxury of the soil and climate. The legions of Augustus melted away into seas and lassitude, and it is only by a naval power that the reduction of Yemen has been successfully attempted. When Mohammed erected this holy standard, that kingdom was a province of the Persian Empire, yet seven princes of the Homerites still reigned in the mountains, and the vice-regent of Kosaris was tempted to forget his distant country and his unfortunate master. The historians of the age of Justinian represent the state of the independent Arabs, who were divided by interest or affection in the long quarrel of the East. The tribe of Gassan was allowed to encamp on the Scythian territory. The princes of Hira were permitted to form a city about forty miles to the southward of the ruin of Babylon. Their service in the field was speedy and victorious, but their friendship was venal, their faith inconstant, their enmity capricious. It was an easier task to excite than to disarm these roving barbarians, and, in the familiar intercourse of war, they learned to see, and to despise, 
the splendid weakness both of Rome and of Persia. From Mecca to the Euphrates, the Arabian tribes were confounded by the Greeks and Latins under the general appellation of Saracens, a name which every Christian mouth has been taught to pronounce with terror and abhorrence. End of chapter 50, part 1「of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5, Chapter 50, Part 2. The slaves of domestic tyranny may vainly exult in their national independence, but the Arab is personally free, and he enjoys in some degree the benefits of society without forfeiting the prerogatives of nature. In every tribe, superstition, or gratitude, or fortune, has exalted a particular family above the heads of their equals. The dignities of sheikh and emir invariably descend in this chosen race, but the order of secession is loose and precarious, and the most worthy or aged of the noble kinsmen are preferred to the simple though important office of composing disputes by their advice and guiding valor by their example. Even a female of sense and spirit has been permitted to command this countryman of Zenobia. The momentary injunction of several tribes produces an army. Their more lasting union constitutes a nation, and the supreme chief the emir of emirs, whose banner is displayed at their head, may deserve, in the eyes of strangers, the honors of the kingly name. If the Arabian princes abuse their power, they are quickly punished by the desertion of their subjects, who had been accustomed to a mild and parental jurisdiction. Their spirit is free, their steps are unconfined, the desert is open, and the tribes and families are held together by a mutual and voluntary compact. The softer natives of Yemen supported the pomp and majesty of a monarch, but if he could not leave his palace without endangering his life, the active powers of government must have been devolved on his nobles and magistrates. The cities of Mecca and Medina present, in the heart of Asia, the form, or rather the substance, of a commonwealth. The grandfather of Mohammed and his lineal ancestors appear in foreign and domestic transactions as the princes of their country. But they reigned, like Pericles at Athens, or the Medici at Florence, by the opinion of their wisdom and integrity. Their influence was divided with their patrimony, and the poverty of the land has introduced a maxim of jurisprudence, which they believe and practice to the present hour. They pretend that, in the division of the earth, the rich and fertile climates were assigned to the other branches of the human family, and that the posterity of the outlaw Ismail might recover, by fraud or force, a portion of inheritance of which he had been unjustly deprived. According to the remark of Pliny, the Arabian tribes are equally addicted to theft and merchandise. The caravans that traverse the desert are ransomed or pillaged, and their neighbors, since the remote times of Job and Sesostris, have been the victims of their rapacious spirit. If a Bedouin discovers from afar a solitary traveler, he rides furiously against him, crying with a loud voice, Undress thyself! Thy aunt, my wife, is without a garment. A ready submission entitles him to mercy. Resistance will provoke the aggressor, and his own blood must expiate the blood which he presumes to shed in legitimate defense. A single robber, or a few associates, are branded with their genuine name but the exploits of a numerous band assume the character of a lawful and honorable war. The temper of a people thus armed against mankind was doubly inflamed by the domestic license of rapine, murder, and vengeance. In the constitution of Europe, the right of peace and war is now confined to a small, and the actual exercise to a much smaller, list of respectable potentates. But each Arab, with impunity and renown, might point his javelin against the life of his countrymen. The union of the nation consisted only in a vague resemblance of language and manners, and in each community 
the jurisdiction of the magistrate was mute and impotent. Of the time of ignorance which preceded Mohammed, 1,700 battles are recorded by tradition. Hostility was embittered with the rancor of civil faction, and the recital, in prose or verse, of an obsolete feud was sufficient to rekindle the same passions among the descendants of the hostile tribes. In private life, every man, at least every family, was the judge and avenger of its own cause. The nice sensibility of honor, which weighs the insult rather than the injury, sheds its deadly venom on the quarrels of the Arabs. The honor of their women, and of their beards, is most easily wounded, and in decent action a contemptuous word can be expiated only by the blood of the offender, and such is their patient inveteracy that they expect whole months and years the opportunity of revenge. A fine, or compensation, for murder is familiar to the barbarians of every age, but in Arabia the kinsmen of the dead are at liberty to accept the atonement, or to exercise with their own hands the law of retaliation. The refined malice of the Arabs refuses even the head of the murderer, and substitutes an innocent to the guilty person, and transfers the penalty to the best and most considerable of the race by whom they have been injured. If he falls by their hands, they are exposed in their turn to the dangers of reprisals. The interest and principle of the bloody debt are accumulated. The individuals of either family lead a life of malice and suspicion, and fifty years may sometimes elapse before the account of vengeance be finally settled. This sanguinary spirit, ignorant of pity or forgiveness, has been moderated, however, by the maxims of honor, which require in every private encounter some decent equality of age and strength, of numbers and weapons. An annual festival of two, perhaps of four months, was observed by the Arabs before the time of Muhammad, during which their swords were religiously sheathed, both in foreign and domestic hostility, and this partial truce is more strongly expressive of the habits of anarchy and warfare. But the spirit of rapine and revenge was attempered by the milder influence of trade and literature. The solitary peninsula is encompassed by the most civilized nations of the ancient world. The merchant is the friend of mankind, and the annual caravans imported the first seeds of knowledge and politeness into the cities and even the camps of the desert. Whatever may be the pedigree of the Arabs, their language is derived from the same original stock with the Hebrew, the Syriac, and the Chaldean tongues. The independence of the tribes was marked by their peculiar dialects, but each, after their own, allowed a just preference to the pure and perspicuous idiom of Mecca. In Arabia, as well as in Greece, the perfection of language outstripped the refinement of manners, and her speech could diversify the fourscore names of honey, the two hundred of a serpent, the five hundred of a lion, the thousand of a sword, at a time when this copious dictionary was entrusted to the memory of an illiterate people. The monuments of the Homerites was inscribed with an obsolete and mysterious character, but the Cufic letters, the groundwork of the present alphabet, were invented on the banks of the Euphrates, and the recent invention was taught at Mecca by a stranger who settled in that city after the birth of Muhammad. The arts of grammar, of meter, and of rhetoric were unknown to the freeborn eloquence of the Arabians, but their penetration was sharp, their fancy luxuriant, their wit strong and sententious, and their more elaborate compositions were addressed with energy and effect to the minds of their hearers. The genius and merit of a rising poet was celebrated by the applause of his own and the kindred tribes. A solemn banquet was prepared, and a chorus of women, striking their timbles and displaying the pomp of their nuptials, sung in the presence of their sons and husbands the felicity of their native tribe, that a champion had now appeared to vindicate their rights, that a herald had raised his voice to immortalize their renown. The distant or hostile tribes resorted to an annual fair, which was abolished by the fanaticism of the first Muslims. A national assembly that must have contributed to refine and harmonize the barbarians. Thirty days were employed in the exchange, not only of corn and wine, but of eloquence and poetry. The prize was disputed by the generous emulation of the bards. The victorious performance was deposited in the archives of princes and emirs, 
and we may read in our own language the seven original poems which were inscribed in letters of gold and suspended in the temple of Mecca. The Arabian poets were the historians and moralists of the age, and if they sympathized with the prejudices, they inspired and crowned the virtues of their countrymen. The indissoluble union of generosity and valor was the darling theme of their song, and when they pointed their keenest satire against a despicable race, they affirmed, in the bitterness of reproach, that the men knew not how to give, nor the women to deny. The same hospitality which was practiced by Abraham and celebrated by Homer is still renewed in the camps of the Arabs. The ferocious Bedouins, the terror of the desert, embrace, without inquiry or hesitation, the stranger who dares to confide in their honor and to enter their tent. His treatment is kind and respectful. He shares the wealth or the poverty of his host, and, after a needful repose, he is dismissed on his way with thanks, with blessings, and perhaps with gifts. The heart and hand are more largely expanded by the wants of a brother or a friend, but the heroic acts that could deserve the public applause must have surpassed the narrow measure of discretion and experience. A dispute had arisen, who, among the citizens of Mecca, was entitled to the prize of generosity, and a successive application was made to the three who were deemed most worthy of the trial. Abdallah, the son of Abbas, had undertaken a distant journey, and his foot was in the stirrup when he heard the voice of a suppliant. O son of the uncle of the apostle of God, I am a traveler and in distress. He instantly dismounted to present the pilgrim with his camel, her rich comparison, and a purse of four thousand pieces of gold, excepting only the sword, either for its intrinsic value, or as the gift of an honored kinsman. The servant of Caius informed the second suppliant that his master was asleep, but he immediately added, Here is a purse of seven thousand pieces of gold, as it is all we have in the house, and here is an order that will entitle you to a camel and a slave. The master, as soon as he awoke, praised and enfranchised his faithful steward, with the gentle reproof that, by respecting his slumbers, he had stinted his bounty. The third of these heroes, the blind Araba, at the hour of prayer was supporting his steps on the shoulders of two slaves. Alas, he replied, my coffers are empty, but these you may sell. If you refuse, I renounce them. At these words, pushing away the youths, he groped along the wall with his staff. The character of Hatem is the perfect model of Arabian virtue. He was brave and liberal, an eloquent poet, and a successful robber. Forty camels were roasted at his hospitable feasts, and at the prayer of a suppliant enemy he restored both the captives and the spoil. The freedom of his countrymen disdained the laws of justice. They proudly indulged the spontaneous impulse of pity and benevolence. The religion of the Arabs, as well as of the Indians, consisted in the worship of the sun, the moon, and the fixed stars, a primitive and specious mode of superstition. The bright luminaries in the sky display the visible image of a deity. Their number and distance convey, to a philosophic, or even to a vulgar eye, the idea of boundless space. The character of eternity is marked on these solid globes, that seem incapable of corruption or decay. The regularity of their motions may be ascribed to a principle of reason or instinct, and their real or imaginary influence encourages the vain belief that the earth and its inhabitants are the object of their peculiar care. The science of astronomy was cultivated at Babylon, but the school of the Arabs was a clear firmament and a naked plain. In their nocturnal marches they steered by the guidance of the stars. Their names and order and daily station were familiar to the curiosity and devotion of the Bedouin, and he was taught by experience to divide in twenty-eight parts the zodiac of the moon, and to bless the constellations who refreshed with salutary rains the thirst of the desert. The reign of the heavenly orbs could not be extended beyond the visible sphere, and some metaphysical powers were necessary to sustain the transmigration of souls and the resurrection of bodies. A camel was left to perish on the grave, that he might serve his master in another life 
and the invocation of departed spirits implies that they were still endowed with consciousness and power. I am ignorant, and I am careless, of the blind mythology of the barbarians, of the local deities, of the stars, of the air, of the earth, of their sex, or titles, their attributes, or subordination. Each tribe, each family, each independent warrior created and changed the rites and object of his fantastic worship. But the nation, in every age, has bowed to the religion as well as to the language of Mecca. The genuine antiquity of the Kaaba ascends beyond the Christian era. In describing the coast of the Red Sea, the Greek historian Diodorus has remarked, between the Thamudites and the Sabaeans, a famous temple, whose superior sanctity was revered by all the Arabians, the linen or silken veil, which is annually renewed by the Turkish emperor, was first offered by a pious king of the Homerites, who reigned seven hundred years before the time of Muhammad. A tent or a caravan might suffice for the worship of the savages, but an edifice of stone and clay has been erected in its place and the art and power of the monarchs of the East had been confined to the simplicity of the original model. A spacious portico encloses the quadrangle of the Kaaba, a square chapel twenty-four cubits long, twenty-three broad, and twenty-seven high. A door and a window admit the light. The double roof is supported by three pillars of wood. A spout, now of gold, discharges the rainwater and the well, Zemzem, is protected by a dome of accidental pollution. The tribe of Koresh, by fraud or force, had acquired the custody of the Kaaba. The sacerdotal office devolved through four lineal descendants to the grandfather of Muhammad, and the family of the Hashemites, from whence he sprung, was the most respectable and sacred in the eyes of their country. The precincts of Mecca enjoyed the rites of sanctuary, and in the last month of each year, the city and the temple were crowned with a long train of pilgrims, who presented their vows and offerings in the house of God. The same rites which are now accomplished by the faithful Mussulmen were invented and practiced by the superstition of the idolaters. At an awful distance they cast away their garments. Seven times, with hasty steps, they encircled the Kaaba, and kissed the black stone. Seven times they visited and adored the adjacent mountains. Seven times they threw stones into the valley of Mina, and the pilgrimage was achieved, as at the present hour, by a sacrifice of sheep and camels, and the burial of their hair and nails in the consecrated ground. Each tribe either found or introduced in the Kaaba their domestic worship. The tribe was adorned or deified with three hundred and sixty idols of men, eagles, lions, and antelopes, and the most conspicuous was the statue of Hebal, of red agate, holding in his hand seven arrows without heads or feathers, the instruments and symbols of profane divination. But this statue was a monument of Syrian arts. The devotion of the ruder ages was content with a pillar or a tablet, and the rocks of the desert were hewn into gods or altars in imitation of the black stone of Mecca which is deeply tainted with the reproach of an idolatrous origin. From Japan to Peru, the use of sacrifice has universally prevailed, and the votary has expressed his gratitude or fear by destroying or consuming, in honor of the gods, the dearest and most precious of their gifts. The life of a man is the most precious oblation to deprecate a public calamity. The altars of Phoenicia and Egypt of Rome and Carthage, have been polluted with human gore. The cruel practice was long preserved among the Arabs. In the third century, a boy was annually sacrificed by the tribe of the Dumatians, and a royal captive was piously slaughtered by the prince of the Saracens, the ally and soldier of the emperor Justinian. A parent who drags his son to the altar exhibits the most painful and sublime effort of fanaticism. The deed or the intention was sanctified by the example of saints and heroes, and the father of Muhammad himself was devoted by a rash vow, and hardly ransomed by the equivalent of a hundred camels. In the time of ignorance, the Arabs, like the Jews and Egyptians, abstained from the taste of swine's flesh. 
they circumcised their children at the age of puberty. The same customs, without censure, or the precept of the Koran, have been silently transmitted to their posterity and proselytes. It has been sagaciously conjectured that the artful legislator indulged the stubborn prejudices of his countrymen. It is more simple to believe that he adhered to the habits and opinions of his youth, without foreseeing that a practice congenial to the climate of Mecca might become useless or inconvenient on the banks of the Danube or the Volga. End of chapter 50, part 2Chapter 50, Part 3 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5, Chapter 50, Part 3. Arabia was free. The adjacent kingdoms were shaken by the storms of conquest and tyranny, and the persecuted sects fled to the happy land where they might profess what they thought, and practice what they professed. The religion of the Sabians and the Magians, of the Jews and Christians, were disseminated from the Persian Gulf to the Red Sea. In a remote period of antiquity, Sabianism was diffused over Asia by the science of the Chaldeans and the arms of the Assyrians. From the observations of two thousand years, the priests and astronomers of Babylon deduced the eternal laws of nature and providence. They adored the seven gods or angels who directed the course of the seven planets, and shed their irresistible influence on the earth. The attributes of the seven planets, with the twelve signs of the zodiac and the twenty-four constellations of the northern and southern hemisphere, were represented by images and talismans. The seven days of the week were dedicated to the respective deities. The Sabians prayed thrice each day, and the Temple of the Moon at Haran was the term of their pilgrimage. But the flexible genius of their faith was always ready either to teach or to learn. In the tradition of the creation, the deluge, and the patriarchs, they held a singular agreement with their Jewish captives. They appealed to the secret books of Adam, Seth, and Enoch, and a slight diffusion of the gospel has transformed the last remnant of the polytheists into the Christians of St. John, in the territory of Basra. The altars of Babylon were overturned by the Magians, but the injuries of the Sabians were revenged by the sword of Alexander. Persia groaned above five hundred years under a foreign yoke, and the purest disciples of Zoroaster escaped from the contagion of idolatry, and breathed with their adversaries the freedom of the desert. Seven hundred years before the death of Mohammed, the Jews were settled in Arabia, and a far greater multitude was expelled from the Holy Land in the wars of Titus and Hadrian. The industrious exiles aspired to liberty and power. They erected synagogues in the cities and castles in the wilderness, and their Gentile converts were confounded with the children of Israel, whom they resembled in the outward mark of circumcision. The Christian missionaries were still more active and successful. The Catholics asserted their universal reign. The sects whom they oppressed successively retired beyond the limits of the Roman Empire. The Martianites, the Manichaeans, dispersed their fantastic opinions and apocryphal gospels. The churches of Yemen and the princes of Hira and Ghassan were instructed in a purer creed by the Jacobite and Nestorian bishops. The liberty of choice was presented to the tribes. Each Arab was free to elect or to compose his private religion, and the rude superstition of his house was mingled with the sublime theology of saints and philosophers. A fundamental article of faith was inculcated by the consent of the learned strangers, the existence of one supreme God, who is exalted above the powers of heaven and earth, but who has often revealed himself to mankind by the ministries of his angels and prophets, and whose grace or justice has interrupted by seasonable miracles, the order of nature. The most rational of the Arabs acknowledged his power, though they neglected his worship, and it was habit rather than conviction which still attached them to the relics of idolatry. The Jews and Christians were the people of the book. The Bible was already translated into Arabic language, and the volume of the Old Testament was accepted by the concord of these implacable enemies. In the story of the Hebrew patriarchs, 
the Arabs were pleased to discover the fathers of their nation. They applauded the birth and promises of Ismael, revered the faith and virtue of Abraham, traced his pedigree and their own to the creation of the first man, and imbibed with equal credulity the prodigies of the holy text and the dreams and traditions of the Jewish rabbis. The base and plebeian origin of Muhammad is an unskillful calumny of the Christians, who exalt, instead of degrading, the merit of their adversary. His descent from Ismail was a national privilege or fable, but if the first steps of the pedigree are dark and doubtful, he could produce many generations of pure and genuine nobility. He sprung from the tribe of Koresh, and the family of Hashem, the most illustrious of the Arabs, the princes of Mecca, and the hereditary guardians of the Kaaba. The grandfather of Muhammad was Abdul Matalib, the son of Hashem, a wealthy and generous citizen who relieved the distresses of famine with the supplies of commerce. Mecca, which had been fed by the liberality of the father, was saved by the courage of the son. The kingdom of Yemen was subject to the Christian princes of Abyssinia. Their vassal, Abraha, was provoked by an insult to avenge the honor of the cross, and the holy city was invested by a train of elephants and an army of Africans. A treaty was proposed, and, in the first audience, the grandfather of Muhammad demanded the restitution of his cattle. And why, said Abraha, do you not rather implore my clemency in favor of your temple, which I have threatened to destroy? Because, replied the intrepid chief, the cattle is my own, the Kaaba belongs to the gods, and they will defend their house from injury and sacrilege. The want of provisions, or the valor of the Koresh, compelled the Abyssinians to a disgraceful retreat. Their discomfiture has been adorned with a miraculous flight of birds, who showered down stones on the heads of the infidels, and the deliverance was long commemorated by the era of the elephant. The glory of Abdul Matalib was crowned with domestic happiness. His life was prolonged to the age of one hundred and ten years, and he became the father of six daughters and thirteen sons. His best beloved Abdallah was the most beautiful and modest of the Arabian youth, and in the first night when he consummated his marriage with Amina of the noble race of the Zarites, two hundred virgins are said to have expired of jealousy and despair. Muhammad, the only son of Abdallah and Amina, was born at Mecca, four years after the death of Justinian, and two months after the defeat of the Abyssinians, whose victory would have introduced into the Kaaba the religion of the Christians. In his early infancy he was deprived of his father, his mother, and his grandfather. His uncles were strong and numerous, and in the division of the inheritance, the orphan share was reduced to five camels and an Ethiopian maidservant. At home and abroad, in peace and war, Abu Talib, the most respectable of his uncles, was the guide and guardian of his youth. In his twenty-fifth year he entered into the service of Khadija, a rich and noble widow of Mecca, who soon rewarded his fidelity with the gift of her hand and fortune. The marriage contract, in the simple style of antiquity, recites the mutual love of Muhammad and Khadija, describes him as the most accomplished of the tribe of Koresh, and stipulates a dowry of twelve ounces of gold and twenty camels, which was supplied by the liberality of his uncle. By this alliance the son of Abdallah was restored to the station of his ancestors, and the judicious matron was content with his domestic virtues, till, in the fortieth year of his age, he assumed the title of a prophet and proclaimed the religion of the Koran. According to the tradition of his companions, Muhammad was distinguished by the beauty of his person, an outward gift which is seldom despised except by those to whom it has been refused. Before he spoke, the orator engaged on his side the affections of a public or private audience. They applauded his commanding presence, his majestic aspect, his piercing eye, his gracious smile, his flowing beard, his countenance that painted every sensation of the soul, and his gestures that enforced each expression of the tongue. In the familiar offices of life, he scrupulously adhered to the grave and ceremonious politeness of his country. His respectful attention to the rich and powerful was dignified by his condescension and affability to the poorest citizens of Mecca. The frankness of his manner concealed the artifice of his views, and the habits of courtesy were imputed to personal friendship or universal benevolence. His memory was capacious and retentive, his wit easy and social, 
his imagination sublime, his judgment clear, rapid, and decisive. He possessed the courage both of thought and action, and although his designs might gradually expand with his success, the first idea which he entertained of his divine mission bears the stamp of an original and superior genius. The son of Abdallah was educated in the bosom of the noblest race, in the use of the purest dialect of Arabia, and the fluency of his speech was corrected and enhanced by the practice of discreet and seasonable silence. With these powers of eloquence, Muhammad was an illiterate barbarian. His youth had never been instructed in the arts of reading and writing. The common ignorance exempted him from shame or reproach, but he was reduced to a narrow circle of existence, and deprived of those faithful mirrors which reflect to our mind the minds of sages and heroes. Yet the book of nature and of man was open to his view, and some fancy has been indulged in the political and philosophical observations which are ascribed to the Arabian traveler. He compares the nations and the religions of the earth, discovers the weaknesses of the Persian and Roman monarchies, beholds with pity and indignation the degeneracy of the times, and resolves to unite under one God and one King the invincible spirit and primitive virtues of the Arabs. Our more accurate inquiry will suggest that, instead of visiting the courts, the camps, the temples of the East, the two journeys of Mohammed into Syria were confined to the fairs of Basra and Damascus, that he was only thirteen years of age when he accompanied the caravan of his uncle, and that his duty compelled him to return as soon as he had disposed of the merchandise of Khadija. In these hasty and superficial excursions, the eye of genius might discern some objects invisible to his grosser companions. Some seeds of knowledge might be cast upon a fruitful soil, but his ignorance of the Syriac language must have checked his curiosity, and I cannot perceive in the life or writings of Muhammad that his prospect was far extended beyond the limits of the Arabian world. From every region of that solitary world, the pilgrims of Mecca were annually assembled by the calls of devotion and commerce. In the free concourse of multitudes, a simple citizen, in his native tongue, might study the political state and characters of the tribes, the theory and the practice of the Jews and Christians. Some useful strangers might be tempted or forced to implore the rights of hospitality, and the enemies of Muhammad have named the Jew, the Persian, and the Syrian monk, whom they accused of lending their secret aid to the composition of the Koran. Conversation enriches the understanding, but solitude is the school of genius, and the uniformity of a work denotes the hand of a single artist. From his earliest youth, Muhammad was addicted to religious contemplation. Each year, during the month of Ramadan, he withdrew from the world and from the arms of Khadija. In the cave of Hera, three miles from Mecca, he consulted the spirit of fraud or enthusiasm, whose abode is not in the heavens, but in the mind of the prophet. The faith which, under the name of Islam, he preached to his family and nation, is compounded of an internal truth and a necessary fiction, that there is only one God, and that Muhammad is the apostle of God. It is the boast of the Jewish apologists that, while the learned nations of antiquity were deluded by the fables of polytheism, their simple ancestors of Palestine preserved the knowledge and worship of the true God. The moral attributes of Jehovah may not easily be reconciled with the standard of human virtue. His metaphysical qualities are darkly expressed, but each page of the Pentateuch and the Prophets is an evidence of his power. The unity of his name is inscribed on the first table of the law, and his sanctuary was never defiled by any visible image of the invisible essence. After the ruin of the temple, the faith of the Hebrew exiles was purified, fixed, and enlightened by the spiritual devotion of the synagogue, and the authority of Muhammad will not justify his perpetual reproach that the Jews of Mecca or Medina adored Ezra as the son of God. But the children of Israel had ceased to be a people, and the religions of the world were guilty, at least in the eyes of the prophet, of giving sons or daughters or companions to the supreme God. In the rude idolatry of the Arabs, the crime is manifest and audacious. The Sabians are poorly excused by the preeminence of the first planet or intelligence in their celestial hierarchy, and the Magian system, the conflict of the two principles, betrays the imperfection of the conqueror. 
the Christians of the seventh century had insensibly relapsed into the semblance of paganism. Their private and public vows were addressed to the relics and images that disgraced the temples of the East. The throne of the Almighty was darkened by a cloud of martyrs and saints and angels, the objects of popular veneration, and the Calidrian heretics, who flourished in the fruitful soil of Arabia, invested the Virgin Mary with the name and honors of a goddess. The mysteries of the Trinity and Incarnation appear to contradict the principle of the divine unity. In their obvious sense, they introduced three equal deities and transformed the man Jesus into the substance of the Son of God. An orthodox commentary will satisfy only a believing mind. Intemperate curiosity and zeal had torn the veil of the sanctuary, and each of the Oriental sects was eager to confess that all, except themselves, deserved the reproach of idolatry and polytheism. The creed of Muhammad is free from suspicion or ambiguity, and the Koran is a glorious testimony to the unity of God. The prophet of Mecca rejected the worship of idols and men, of stars and planets, on the rational principle that whatever rises must set, that whatever is born must die, and that whatever is corruptible must decay and perish. In the author of the universe, his rational enthusiasm confessed and adored an infinite and eternal being, without form or place, without issue or similitude, present to our most secret thoughts, existing by the necessity of his own nature, and deriving from himself all moral and intellectual perfection. These sublime truths, thus announced in the language of the prophet, are firmly held by his disciples, and defined with metaphysical precision by the interpreters of the Quran. A philosophic theist might subscribe the popular theory of the Muhammads, a creed too sublime perhaps for our present faculties. What object remains for the fancy or even the understanding when we have abstracted from the unknown substance all ideas of time and space, of motion and matter, of sensation and reflection? The first principle of reason and revelation was confirmed by the voice of Muhammad, his proselytes from India to Morocco are distinguished by the name of Unitarians, and the danger of idolatry has been prevented by the interdiction of images. The doctrine of internal decrees and absolute predestination is strictly embraced by the Mohammedans. They struggle with the common difficulties, how to reconcile the prescience of God with the freedom and responsibility of man how to explain the permission of evil under the reign of infinite power and infinite goodness. The God of nature has written his existence on all his works, and his law in the heart of man. To restore the knowledge of the one and the practice of the other has been the real or pretended aim of the prophets of every age. The liberality of Muhammad allowed to his predecessors the same credit which he claimed for himself, and the chain of inspiration was prolonged after the fall of Adam to the promulgation of the Koran. During that period, some rays of prophetic light had been imparted to 124,000 of the elect, discriminated by their respective measure of virtue and grace. 313 apostles were sent with a special commission to recall their country from idolatry and vice. 104 volumes had been dictated by the Holy Spirit, and six legislators of transcendent brightness have announced to mankind six successive revelations of various rites, but of one immutable religion. The authority and station of Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Christ, and Mohammed rise in just graduation above each other, but whosoever hates or rejects any of one of the prophets is numbered with the infidels. The writings of the patriarchs were extant only in the apocryphal copies of the Greeks and Syrians. The conduct of Adam had not entitled him to the gratitude or respect of his children. The seven precepts of Noah were observed by an inferior and imperfect class of the proselytes of the synagogue. The memory of Abraham was obscurely revered by the Sabians in his native land of Chaldea. Of the myriads of prophets, Moses and Christ alone lived and reigned, and the remnant of the inspired writings was comprised in the books of the Old and New Testament. The miraculous story of Moses is consecrated and embellished in the Koran, and the captive Jews enjoy the secret revenge of imposing their own belief on the nations whose recent creeds they deride. For the author of Christianity, 
the Muhammads are taught by the Prophet to entertain a high and mysterious reverence. Verily, Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, is the Apostle of God, and his word which he conveyed unto Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him, honorable in this world, and in the world to come, and one of those who approach near to the presence of God. The wonders of the genuine and apocryphal Gospels are profusely heaped on his head, and the Latin Church has not disdained to borrow from the Koran the Immaculate Conception of his Virgin Mother. Yet Jesus was a mere mortal, and at the Day of Judgment his testimony will serve to condemn both the Jews who reject him as a prophet, and the Christians who adore him as the Son of God. The malice of his enemies aspersed his reputation and conspired against his life, but their intention only was guilty. A phantom or criminal was substituted on the cross and the innocent saint was translated to the seventh heaven. During six hundred years the gospel was the way of truth and salvation, but the Christians insensibly forgot both the laws and example of their founder, and Mohammed was instructed by the Gnostics to accuse the church, as well as the synagogue, of corrupting the integrity of the sacred text. The piety of Moses and of Christ rejoiced in the assurance of a future prophet, more illustrious than themselves, the evangelic promise of the paraclete, or Holy Ghost, was prefigured in the name and accomplished in the person of Muhammad, the greatest and last of the apostles of God. End of chapter 50, part 3《The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5, Chapter 50, Part 4. — The communication of ideas requires a solemnitude of thought and language. The discourse of a philosopher would vibrate without effect on the ear of a peasant. Yet how minute is the distance of their understandings, if it be compared with the contact of an infinite and a finite mind, with the word of God expressed by the tongue or the pen of a mortal? The inspiration of the Hebrew prophets, of the apostles and evangelists of Christ, might not be incompatible with the exercise of their reason and memory and the diversity of their genius is strongly marked in the style and composition of the books of the Old and New Testament. But Muhammad was content with a character more humble, yet more sublime, of a simple editor. The substance of the Quran, according to himself or his disciples, is uncreated and eternal, subsisting in the essence of the deity, inscribed with the pen of light on the table of his everlasting decrees. A paper copy, in the volume of silk and gems, was brought down to the lowest heaven by the angel Gabriel, who, under the Jewish economy, had indeed been dispatched on the most important errands, and this trusty messenger successively revealed the chapters and verses to the Arabian prophet. Instead of a perpetual and perfect measure of the divine will, the fragments of the Quran were produced at the discretion of Muhammad. Each revelation is suited to the emergencies of his policy or passion and all contradiction is removed by the saving maxim that any text of scripture is abrogated or modified by any subsequent passage. The word of God and of the apostle was diligently recorded by his disciples on palm leaves and the shoulder bones of a mutton, and the pages, without order or connection, were cast into a domestic chest in the custody of one of his wives. Two years after the death of Mohammed, the sacred volume was collected and published by his friend and successor, Abu Bekr. The work was revised by the Caliph Uthman in the thirtieth year of the Hegira, and the various editions of the Quran assert the same miraculous privilege of an uniform and incorruptible text. In the spirit of enthusiasm or vanity, the Prophet rests the truth of his mission on the merit of his book, audaciously challenges both men and angels to imitate the beauties of a single page and presumes to assert that God alone could dictate this incomparable performance. This argument is most powerfully addressed to the devout Arabian, whose mind is attuned to faith and rapture, 
whose ear is delighted by the music of sounds, and whose ignorance is incapable of comparing the productions of human genius. The harmony and copiousness of style will not reach, in a version, the European infidel. He will peruse with impatience the endless, incoherent rhapsody of fable, and precept, and declamation, which seldom excites a sentiment, or an idea, which sometimes crawls in the dust, and is sometimes lost in the clouds. The divine attributes exalt the fancy of the Arabian missionary, but his loftiest strains must yield to the sublime simplicity of the book of Job, composed in a remote age, in the same country, and in the same language. If the composition of the Koran exceeds the faculties of a man, to what superior intelligence should we ascribe the Iliad of Homer, or the Philippics of Demosthenes? In all religions, the life of the founder supplies the silence of his written revelation. The sayings of Muhammad were so many lessons of truth, his actions so many examples of virtue, and the public and private memorials were preserved by his wives and companions. At the end of two hundred years, the sana, or oral law, was fixed and consecrated by the labors of al bukhari who discriminated 7,273 genuine traditions from a mass of 300,000 reports of a more doubtful or spurious character. Each day the pious author prayed in the temple of Mecca, and performed his ablutions with the water of Zemzem. The pages were successively deposited on the pulpit, and the sepulchre of the apostle, and the work has been approved by the four orthodox sects of the Sonites. The mission of the ancient prophets, of Moses and of Jesus, had been confirmed by many splendid prodigies, and Mohammed was repeatedly urged by the inhabitants of Mecca and Medina to produce a similar evidence of his divine legation, to call down from heaven the angel or the volume of his revelation, to create a garden in the desert, or to kindle a conflagration in the unbelieving city. As often as he is pressed by the demands of the Koreish, he involves himself in the obscure boast of vision and prophecy, appeals to the internal proofs of his doctrine, and shields himself behind the providence of God, who refuses those signs and wonders that would deprecate the merit of faith and aggravate the guilt of infidelity. But the modest or angry tone of his apologies betrays his weakness and vexation, and these passages of scandal establish beyond suspicion the integrity of the Koran. The votaries of Mohammed are more assured than himself of his miraculous gifts, and their confidence and credulity increase as they are further removed from the time and place of his spiritual exploits. They believe, or affirm, that trees went forth to meet him, that he was saluted by stones, that water gushed from his fingers, that he fed the hungry, cured the sick, and raised the dead, that a beam groaned to him, that a camel complained to him, that a shoulder of mutton informed him of its being poisoned, and that both animate and inanimate nature were equally subject to the apostle of God. His dream of a nocturnal journey is seriously described as a real and corporal transaction. A mysterious animal, the Borak, conveyed him from the temple of Mecca to that of Jerusalem. With his companion, Gabriel, he successively ascended the seven heavens, and received and repaid the salutations of the patriarchs, the prophets, and the angels in their respective mansions. Beyond the seventh heaven, Muhammad alone was permitted to proceed. He passed the veil of unity, approached within two bowshots of the throne, and felt a cold that pierced him to the heart when his shoulder was touched by the hand of God. After this familiar, though important, conversation, he again descended to Jerusalem, remounted the Barak, returned to Mecca, and performed in the tenth part of the night the journey of many thousand years. According to another legend, the apostle confounded in a national assembly the malicious charge of the Koreish. His resistless word split asunder the orb of the moon. The obedient planet stooped from her station in the sky, accomplished the seven revolutions around the Kaaba, saluted Muhammad in the Arabian tongue, and suddenly contracting her dimensions, entered at the collar and issued forth through the sleeve of his shirt. The vulgar are amused with these marvelous tales but the gravest of the Mussulman doctors imitate the modesty of their master, and indulge a latitude of faith or interpretation. They might speciously allege that in preaching the religion it was needless to violate the harmony of nature, that a creed unclouded with mystery may be excused for miracles, and that the sword of Muhammad was not less potent than the rod of Moses. 
The polytheist is oppressed and distracted by the variety of superstition. A thousand rites of Egyptian origin were interwoven with the essence of the Mosaic law, and the spirit of the gospel had evaporated in the pageantry of the church. The prophet of Mecca was tempted by prejudice, or policy, or patriotism, to sanctify the rites of the Arabians, and the custom of visiting the holy stone of the Kaaba. But the precepts of Mohammed himself inculcate a more simple and rational piety. Prayer, fasting, and alms are the religious duties of a Mussulman. He is encouraged to hope that prayer will carry him halfway to God, fasting will bring him to the door of his palace, and alms will gain him admittance. 1. According to the tradition of the nocturnal journey, the apostle, in his personal conference with the deity, was commanded to impose on his disciples the daily obligation of fifty prayers. By the advice of Moses, he applied for an alleviation of this intolerable burden. The number was gradually reduced to five, without any dispensation of business or pleasure, or time or place. The devotion of the faithful is repeated at daybreak, at noon, in the afternoon, in the evening, and at the first watch of the night, and in the present decay of religious fervor, our travelers are edified by the profound humility and attention of the Turks and the Persians. Cleanliness is the key of prayer. The frequent lustration of the hands, the face, and the body, which was practiced of old by the Arabs, is solemnly enjoined by the Koran, and a permission is formally granted to supply with sand the scarcity of water. The words and attitudes of supplication, as it is performed either sitting or standing or prostrate on the ground, are prescribed by custom or authority. But the prayer is poured forth in short and fervent ejaculations. The measure of zeal is not exhausted by a tedious liturgy, and each Mussulman for his own person is invested with the character of a priest. Among the theists, who reject the use of images, it has been found necessary to restrain the wanderings of the fancy, by directing the eye and the thought towards a kepla, or visible point of the horizon. The prophet was at first inclined to gratify the Jews by the choice of Jerusalem, but he soon returned to a more natural partiality, and five times every day the eyes of the nation at Atraskan, at Fez, at Delhi, are devoutly turned to the holy temple of Mecca. Yet every spot for the service of God is equally pure. The Mohammedans indifferently pray in their chambers or in the street. As a distinction from the Jews and Christians, the Friday in each week is set apart for the useful institution of public worship. The people is assembled in their mosques, and the Iman, some respectable elder, ascends the pulpit, to begin the prayer and to pronounce the sermon. But the Mohammedan religion is destitute of priesthood or sacrifice, and the independent spirit of fanaticism looks down with contempt on the ministers and slaves of superstition. 2. The voluntary penance of the ascetics, the torment and the glory of their lives, was odious to a prophet, who censured in his companions a rash vow of abstaining from flesh and women and sleep, and firmly declared that he would suffer no monks in his religion. Yet he instituted, in each year, a fast of thirty days, and strenuously recommended the observance as a discipline which purifies the soul and subdues the body, as a salutary exercise of obedience to the will of God and his apostle. During the month of Ramadan, from the rising to the setting of the sun, the Mussulman abstains from eating, and women, and baths, and perfumes, and from all nourishment that can restore his strength, from all pleasure that can gratify his senses. In the revolution of the lunar year, the Ramadan coincides by turns with the winter cold and the summer heat, and the patient martyr, without assuaging his thirst with a drop of water, must expect the close of a tedious and sultry day. The interdiction of wine, peculiar to some orders of the priests or hermits, is converted by Mohammed alone into a positive and general law, and a considerable portion of the globe has abjured, at his command, the use of that salutary, though dangerous, liquor. These painful restraints are, doubtless, infringed by the libertine, and eluded by the hypocrite, but the legislator, by whom they are enacted, cannot surely be accused of alluring his proselytes by the indulgence of their sensual appetites. 3. The charity of the Mohammedans descends to the animal creation, and the Quran repeatedly inculcates, not as a merit, but as a strict and indispensable duty, the relief of the indigent and unfortunate. Mohammed, perhaps, is the only lawgiver who has defined the precise measure of charity. The standard may vary with the degree and nature of property, 
as it consists either in money or corn or cattle, in fruits or merchandise. But the Mussulman does not accomplish the law unless he bestows a truth of his revenue, and if his consciousness accuses him of fraud or extortion, the tenth under the idea of restitution is enlarged to a fifth. Benevolence is the foundation of justice, since we are forbid to injure those whom we are bound to assist. A prophet may reveal the secrets of heaven and futurity, but in his moral precepts he can only repeat the lessons of his own hearts. The two articles of belief and the four practical duties of the Islam are guarded by rewards and punishments, and the faith of the Mussulman is devoutly fixed on the event of the judgment and the last day. The prophet has not presumed to determine the moment of that awful catastrophe, though he darkly announces the signs, both in heaven and earth, which will precede the universal dissolution, when life shall be destroyed and the order of creation shall be confounded in the primitive chaos. At the blast of the trumpet new worlds will start into being. Angels, genii, and men will arise from the dead, and the human soul will again be united to the body. The doctrine of resurrection was first entertained by the Egyptians, and their mummies were embalmed. Their pyramids were consecrated to preserve the ancient mansion of the souls during a period of three thousand years. But the attempt is partial and unavailing, and it is with a more philosophic spirit that Mohammed relies on the omnipotence of the Creator, whose word can reanimate the breathless clay and collect the innumerable atoms which no longer retain their form or substance. The intermediate state of the soul it is hard to describe, and those who most firmly believe her immaterial nature are at a loss to understand how she can think or act without the agency of the organs of sense. The reunion of the soul and body will be followed by the final judgment of mankind, and in his copy of the Magian picture, the prophet has too faithfully represented the forms of proceeding, and even the slow and successive operations of an earthly tribunal. By his intolerant adversaries he is upbraided for extending, even to themselves, the hope of salvation, for asserting the blackest heresy, that every man who believes in God and accomplishes good works may expect in the last day a favorable sentence. Such rational indifference is ill-adapted to the character of a fanatic, nor is it probable that a messenger from heaven should deprecate the value and necessity of his own revelation. In the idiom of the Quran, the belief of God is inseparable from that of Mohammed. The good works are those which he has enjoined, and the two qualifications imply the profession of Islam, to which all nations and all sects are equally invited. Their spiritual blindness, though excused by ignorance and crowned with virtue, will be scourged with everlasting torments, and the tears which Mohammed shed over the tomb of his mother, for whom he was forbidden to pray, display a striking contrast of humanity and enthusiasm. The doom of the infidels is common. The measure of their guilt and punishment is determined by the degree of evidence which they have rejected, by the magnitude of the heirs which they have entertained. The internal mansions of the Christians, the Jews, the Sabians, the Magians, and the idolaters are sunk below each other in the abyss, and the lowest hell is reserved for the faithless hypocrites who have assumed the mask of religion. After the greater part of mankind has been condemned for their opinions, the true believers only will be judged by their actions. The good and evil of each Mussulman will be accurately weighed in a real or allegorical balance, and a singular mode of compensation will be allowed for the payment of injuries. The aggressor will refund an equivalent of his own good actions for the benefit of the portion whom he has wronged, and if he should be destitute of any moral property, the weight of his sins will be loaded with an adequate share of the demerits of the sufferer. According, as the shares of guilt or virtue shall preponderate, the sentence will be pronounced, and all, without distraction, will pass over the sharp and perilous bridge of the abyss. But the innocent, treading in the footsteps of Mohammed, will gloriously enter the gates of paradise, while the guilty will fall into the first and mildest of the seven hells. The term of expiration will vary from nine hundred to seven thousand years. But the prophet has judiciously promised that all his disciples, whatever may be their sins, shall be saved by their own faith and his intercession from internal damnation. It is not surprising that superstition should act more powerfully on the fears of her votaries, since the human fancy can paint with more energy the misery than the bliss of a future life. With the two simple elements of darkness and fire, we create a sensation of pain, which may be aggravated to an infinite degree by the idea of endless duration. 
but the same idea operates with an opposite effect on the continuity of pleasure, and too much of our patient enjoyments is obtained from the relief or the comparison of evil. It is natural enough that an Arabian prophet should dwell with rapture on the groves, the fountains, and the rivers of paradise, but instead of inspiring the blessed inhabitants with a liberal taste for harmony and science, conversation and friendship, he idly celebrates the pearls and diamonds, the robes of silk, the palaces of marble, dishes of gold, rich wines, artificial dainties, numerous attendants, and the whole train of sensual and costly luxury, which becomes insipid to the owner, even in the short period of this mortal life. 72. Horus, or black-eyed girls of resplendent beauty, blooming youth, virgin purity, and exquisite sensibility, will be created for the use of the meanest believer. A moment of pleasure will be prolonged to a thousand years, and his faculties will be increased a hundredfold to render him worthy of his felicity. Notwithstanding a vulgar prejudice, the gates of heaven will be opened to both sexes, but Mohammed has not specified the male companions of the female elect, lest he should either alarm the jealousy of their former husbands, or disturb the felicity by the suspicion of an everlasting marriage. This image of a carnal paradise has provoked the indignation, perhaps the envy, of the monks. They declaim against the impure religion of Mohammed, and his modest apologists are driven to the poor excuse of figures and allegories. But the sounder and more consistent party adhere, without shame, to the literal interpretation of the Koran. Useless would be the resurrection of the body, unless it were restored to its possession and exercise of its worthiest faculties, and the union of sensual and intellectual enjoyment is requisite to complete the happiness of the double animal, the perfect man. Yet the joys of the Mohammedan paradise will not be confined to the indulgence of luxury and appetite, and the prophet has expressly declared that all meaner happiness will be forgotten and despised by the saints and martyrs who will be admitted to the beatitude or the divine vision. The first and most ardent conquests of Mohammed were those of his wife, his servant, his pupil, and his friend, since he presented himself as a prophet to those who were most conversant with his infirmities as a man. Yet Khadija believed the words, and cherished the glory of her husband. The obsequious and affectionate Zaid was tempted by the prospect of freedom. The illustrious Ali, the son of Abu Talib, embraced the sentiments of his cousin with the spirit of a youthful hero, and the wealth, the moderation, and veracity of Abu Bekr confirmed the religion of the prophet whom he was destined to succeed. By his persuasion, ten of the most respectable citizens of Mecca were introduced to the private lessons of Islam. They yielded to the voice of reason and enthusiasm. They repeated the fundamental creed, There is but one God, and Muhammad is the apostle of God. And their faith, even in this life, was rewarded with riches and honors, with the command of armies and the government of kingdoms. Three years were silently employed in the conversion of fourteen proselytes, the first fruits of his mission. But in the fourth year he assumed the prophetic office, and resolving to impart to his family the light of divine truth, he prepared a banquet, a lamb, it is said, and a bowl of milk for the entertainment of forty guests of the race of Hashim. Friends and kinsmen, said Mohammed to the assembly, I offer you, and I alone can offer the most precious of gifts, the treasures of this world and of the world to come. God has commanded me to call you to his service. Who among you will support my burden? Who among you will be my companion and my vizier? No answer was returned, till the silence of astonishment and doubt and contempt was at length broken by the impatient courage of Ali, a youth in the fourteenth year of his age. O prophet, I am the man. Whosoever rises against me, I will dash out his teeth, tear out his eyes, break his legs, rip up his belly. O prophet, I will be thy vizier over them. Mohammed accepted his offer with transport and Abu Talib was ironically exhorted to respect the superior dignity of his son. In a more serious tone, the father of Ali advised his nephew to relinquish his impracticable design. Spare your remonstrances, replied the intrepid fanatic to his uncle and benefactor. If they should place the sun on my right hand and the moon on my left, they should not divert me from my course. He persevered ten years in the exercise of his mission, and the religion which has overspread the East and the West, 
advanced with a slow and painful progress within the walls of Mecca. Yet Mohammed enjoyed the satisfaction of beholding the increase of his infant congregation of Unitarians, who revered him as a prophet, and to whom he seasonably dispensed the spiritual nourishment of the Quran. The number of proselytes may be esteemed by the absence of eighty-three men and eighteen women, who retired to Ethiopia in the seventh year of his mission, and his party was fortified by the timely conversion of his uncle Hamza, and of the fierce and inflexible Omar, who signalized in the cause of Islam the same zeal which he exerted for its destruction. Nor was the charity of Mohammed confined to the tribe of Koreish, or the precinct of Mecca. On solemn festivals, in the days of pilgrimage, he frequented the Kaaba, accosted the strangers of every tribe, and urged, both in private converse and public discourse, the belief and worship of a sole deity. Conscious of his reason and of his weakness, he asserted the liberty of conscience, and disclaimed the use of religious violence. But he called the Arabs to repentance, and conjured them to remember the ancient idolaters of Ad and Thamud, whom the divine justice had swept away from the face of the earth. End of chapter 50, part 4